So that will be available later on our YouTube page. But with that, I'm going to turn things over to the grants team. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am Marion Dini. I'm the library program administrator here at the division. Um, I coordinate all of the grant programs with a fantastic grants team here of David Beach, who handles uh, our LSTA, our federal grant programs, our LSTA, as well as our, uh, our new program, ARPA and CARES Act funding that we've had for the past two years, as well as along with uh, Jennifer Nicholson, our grants specialist, who helps us with all of our day-to-day -day paperwork that we have to do here. Um, we have a lot of stuff that we want to cover today, uh, but we want to make this interactive. So if you have any questions, please, uh, you know, raise your hand, put them into chat. Uh, you do not have to wait to the end. In fact, it's almost better if we can do it as we get to certain points in the discussion so that uh, we can be sure we get everyone's questions answered. Um, there's a lot of stuff, as I said, we wanted to cover. This was going to be related to our DLIS Florida American Rescue Plan Act grant funding. Uh, this funding was funded by through the Institute of Museum and Library Services from the federal government. Um, the way the funding was set up, the ARPA program is administered or will be administered uh, under the same rules and guidance as the uh, Library Services and Technology Act or LSTA program. So if you see information on the on some of our documents and stuff where we where it's it's called lsta versus arpa it is the same guidelines the same uh governing statutes and what have you related to a lot of these different things so it has the same uh, catalog of federal domestic assistance number etc so we will be using those terms uh you'll see some of those used interchangeably although we will be trying to talk just specifically to um the ARPA program today. Um, so that's sort of where I wanted to start out just to kind of give you all a heads up of where things are going. Uh, I did want to uh, also mention one major change that is occurring right now that, that everyone does need to be aware of. And that is a change from using a what's called a DUNS number uh, by the federal government to what's now called a UEI number, a unique entity identifier number. Uh, there was an email that went out uh, recently, came out from Jennifer to all of our grant recipients talking about our UEI number. I think it's under the paperwork, Jennifer, um, that uh, everybody will be required. If you have a DUNS number, you have to get a new UEI number. There is a process in place where there will be an automatic transition of numbers, but you all need to will need to make sure that your number, uh, your organization does have a UEI number. It would probably not be specific to your library. In most cases, it will be your larger entity, such as your board of county commissioners, your city government, the university, or what have you. And in many cases, you may already have the your organization may already have that number. You will need to go in and add that to the Department of State grants system. We will be um, unable after April. We will be unable to pay any grant payments until you have a UEI number. So I would highly recommend that you check on that sooner rather than later. It won't stop us from doing our paperwork that we're gonna be talking about next, but it may take some time if you have to do some basic basic uh, steps in that process or get with other folks. I just want to call that uh, to your attention since that's a major change from, and this would apply to our LSTA funding as well as our the ARPA grant funding. So that's a new change has come down from the federal government. Um, so that's basically um, the main thing that I wanted to call your attention to. Um, and so what I think I'm going to do now is go ahead and turn it over to David to um, to go ahead and start through the whole process. Um, and I'm looking at a question from Vicki. Um, would it be accurate to say that the entity that is named in the grant is the organization level that needs the UEI? Um, in your case, such as the co-op, the public library cooperative, you may need your own UEI number. If um, it depends upon how you currently 
does the county do you do you use the county's duns number right now if you do then you would need to use the county's uei number otherwise you would need to get your own in your unique situation there in a cooperative okay so i'm going to go ahead and turn that over to turn the next part of the process over to david beach and let him walk us through all of the processes good morning everyone and we're happy you're here to join us today and uh, first of all just uh, congratulations to everyone uh, if you're on here this morning you're more than likely a successful candidate or applicant for the ARPA grant uh, process and if you've been awarded funding and uh, we want to try to help you any way we can to uh, work through the management of your ARPA grants. Now, if you're not a uh, person that manages ARPA grants, a lot of this information also applies to LSTA grants and also apply to CARES uh, activities last year. So you don't have to uh, leave if you're not an ARPA applicant. As a matter of fact, you're welcome to, to uh, participate all the same but uh, this is uh, aimed mostly toward the ARPA grantees the successful grantees and there's as you're listening to us talk we're going to have some information on the screen and Jennifer is going to try to keep up with what uh, Marion and I uh, actually produce verbally to help you kind of track where you would be looking for the information we're talking about. We have two sources, uh, main sources for information. The one you see on the screen right now is the home page for the grant system, which is dos.myflora.com is the, the main address uh, for our uh, grants uh, information page for the Department of State. So you can see on the screen, we've got the uh, DLIS Florida American Rescue Plan Act ARPA page up, and that is where we have lots of information about ARPA and all the requirements, the guidelines, uh, everything about ARPA that you uh, know or want to know it should be found there and as Marion mentioned earlier some of this overlaps with uh, the uh, grant uh, rules that LSTA follows LSTA is the main program and it's these uh, grants are going to follow all those same rules so you may see references someplace that says LSTA but you can pretty much bet that if it's an LSTA rule, it's like also going to apply to the ARPA uh, function. The other system that you're going to deal with the most, and if you've been involved with the application so far, I mean with the ARPA grant, if you were involved in applying for the grant, you should already have access to the DOS grant system, which uh, is going to be highly uh, used by you in this entire process. We've got that on the screen right now. If you're someone new to the system, we can uh, help you get uh, signed on to the system. Uh, probably the easiest thing you could do at this point is to contact one of the three of us and tell us that you're a new user and we'll need your name and your title and your email address and phone number and we can help get you signed on to the system itself so that uh, being said we're going to assume that most of you are familiar with the grants uh, page the home page and that's what we have up on the screen right at the moment and what we want to do, I want to just show you real quickly here, uh, the other page that we're going to be working on is a grant details page. When you have a grant in the system, you will go into the system and do the drop down that says My Grants. And on the right hand side, when you do My Grants, there'll be a tab 
that will say details, and that you'll see that. And we have multiple grants on this particular page because you're looking at uh, our system here. Most of you are not going to have a lot of grants, but when you see this My Grants list, you want to look for the one that's the ARPA grant, and then you want to go out to the very right-hand side under Actions and click on Details, and that's going to take you to the main page where we're going to spend a lot of time talking about all the options that are available for monitoring your grant, your particular grant in the DOS grant system. Um, I want to add one quick tip in here from what David's talking about with that details button. Uh, if you don't see the details button, check your browser. You may have to scroll further to the right and you may just may not see it on your screen. We have that happen with a number of things that are on the right hand side that we're talking about. If your screen's not the same size or dimensions or what have you, uh, you may not see it immediately. You just use the scroll bar and go to the right and you should find those things. Um, and I do want to add one other thing that David mentioned earlier about getting signed up for the system. Um, if you've got any questions with the grants, and we'll emphasize this multiple times, uh, I would send us an email and I would highly recommend that you send the email to David, Jennifer, and myself. We are right now in the midst of a number of different projects all at the same time. And so we do work very closely as a team. So we want to make sure that your message gets heard and handled as rapidly as we can. So the best thing to do would be to send it to all of us at the same time and someone will get back to you. And I'll throw it back to David. <laughs> okay. Uh, one thing that uh, it made me think while Marion was uh, giving you that additional information, if you can, and it's not possible for everybody, but if you can you try to avoid using Edge as a browser in the grant system, uh, it seems to be a little bit sensitive. Uh, the system uh, isn't particularly fond of Microsoft browsers. Uh, so if you can use Chrome or one of the other options, you know, as a browser, most of the time you're probably going to have a little better luck i'm not saying that edge doesn't function but i think you'll be uh, more pleased if you use some of the other optional browsers to uh, to manage the grants in the in the grant system so we're going to talk about you're going to see what what let's just go start from the beginning and some of you are a little bit further along in the process right now and and then others but at the very beginning, once the uh, library council meets and makes their recommendation to the secretary of state, and then your funding for each individual grant is approved, then we start a process, basically a notification process, and you're given an award letter, and you're also given a notice of grant award at the same time and uh, normally most of this time now these are all sent out electronically these letters first of all acknowledge that you've been given the award it tells you what the amount of the award is it identifies you as the entity and the name of the project all that information appears on there and because of the nature of the process now, there are times when the Notice of Grant Award will contain instructions about things you need to do to move the process forward. And that's where you'll see a reference in the Notice of Grant Award to an application change request. And on the page that's up in the system in front of you, in the grant records details there's an access to an application change request once your grant has been funded you'll be able to go into the grant record details and access an application change request now let me give you some information about this an application change request is going to make some modifications to the information that was originally in your application. For example, 
if the uh, State Library Council or con yes, Council had funding available and they funded a partial portion of your grant for one reason or another so that the amount that you requested say for example was a hundred thousand dollars and the amount that was awarded was ninety five thousand instead you will need to complete an application change request to get that amount registered in the system to show that the amount has changed from what the original application request had in it. That's one example. And when you create the application change request, and that's going to update all the information in the system. There are other pieces. Can we actually get to an application change request, Jennifer? Uh, take note while this is loading. Um, the application change request is only done before the grant agreement is signed. You need to scroll down on the page to get to the application change request. It is slightly different than the change request that's higher up on the page. You don't do that one until after the grant agreement has been signed. Exactly. And on this particular example, we're looking at the change request does appear on there, but when you first get started, you're not going to have a, an active button on on the change request. You're only going to have an active button on the application change request. And uh, once uh, your uh, a contract has been signed, you're not going to ever do another application change request. Everything going forward from that point will be done on a change request, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second here. But you can see on the application change request, now remember, this is we don't have a contract yet. All we have is basically permission from the secretary to fund your particular grant and get the process started and we're trying to account for anything different that uh, something that's changed since the application was submitted. And you can see in here, you know, the summary tab, there's an activities tab, a budget tab, and then there's support materials. These are the areas where you're able to make changes prior to having a signed contract. So let's just say for another example for activities. If for some reason something has changed and the way you're gonna go about accomplishing, and let me make this clear, you have to keep all these changes within the original intent of, of the application. You can't, uh, start out saying I'm going to do training and then end up just buying equipment, you know, and saying that, you know, that that was the uh, the change I want to make is go from one totally unrelated thing to another. It has to be within the framework of the original application, any of these changes that you make. But if for some reason the activities have to be done in a different manner, and let's just say the time frame was shorter and you need to make some adjustments to how you accomplish this that's where you would reflect those changes would be in the activities section same way with the budget you may end up uh, spending you're going to be you know spending the amount that was approved if the amount changed and you didn't get the full amount, then you're gonna be adjusting that amount and you're gonna show how you're going to manage that money in, in, with the new amount. So you would need to spread out the uh, uh, budgeting categories according to the new amount that you are going to receive. Okay. Also, uh, once you have the changes made, what you're going to do is you're going to submit that back. Sometimes people will go in there and they'll make the changes and they'll tell us I'm all done and we're out here waiting to, to see those changes take place in the system. And uh, if you don't submit the changes, 
that's not going to register in the system. So we always ask, if you would, to follow up with an email anytime you have changes that you're making in an application change request. And we ask you to do this in a lot of the processes, if you're doing payments or if it's down the road further when you're doing reporting or you know making payment requests. We like to get a you know just a quick note from you saying hey i i did this uh you might want to check the system and that gives us a chance to you know do the monitoring quicker and 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 uh, actually give you a little better uh customer service that way so we know that if you've done something we can take a quick look at it and that kind of goes back to what marion said about letting all three of us know at the same time so that if one of us happens to be gone on a particular day, the one of the other two of us can pick pick up that uh, activity and, and check it and make sure that it's getting uh, given attention. Okay, so that in let's just assume here that we are we looked at the Noga. You've uh, noted the changes that are needed, either the ones that we directed you had to make or the ones that you know you're going to have to make in order to accomplish you know the uh, intended outcome of the project now you've submitted that application change request back to us we will review that that application change request we will approve it if everything looks you know like it's going to be uh, appropriate and it's going to you know cover everything we need covered to create the contract now there could be a possibility that we don't see everything all the information we needed you may end up getting the application uh, change request referred back to you for additional information and it it'll it will send you a note if that happens and tell you know and describe you know what we need and then you'll be able to go back in and it'll say RFI on there and you'll have a chance to make some additional adjustments to it. And then you can resubmit it the same way as when you submitted it originally. Once we have all those details, now some of you are lucky. Some of you won't have any dollar amount changes. Some of you will be able to do the same activities uh, that you had on the original application you won't have to make any changes. If that's the case, then you can tell us, you know, just send us a note and say, I'm not gonna make any changes. What we'll, we will do at that point is create what we call the contract details. And there's a section on this page, it's down under forms and reports. Uh, I'm not particularly happy about how that's titled, but that's where the contract details are built. And what we will do is we will take the information. If there's no changes from the, from the application change request, this information will come directly from the application. We will, the budget will already be built in, carried over from the application. We will build the deliverables and the scope of work and the contact information will also come from the application. Now, contact information is important because that's where the information that ends up on the actual grant agreement for if there's any anybody, anytime we need information from your entity, we need a name and a number and an email so that we can contact you and, and discuss you know, anything that might be going on with your particular con, uh, grant agreement. So as you can see on this page here, this is the, con the page that has the contact information on it. And here it lists myself as the, you know, the grant uh, manager here in, in the office. And then we have the contact person in the field below that, along with their phone number and email and uh, location address. Uh, at the Let same me, I'm gonna, time. I'm going to jump ahead. in here for just a second, David, give you a chance to get a drink. Jennifer, sure. would you jump back over to the deliverables section, please? Um, when you all are looking at the deliverables, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. 
Uh, the deliverables are what the basis for the payments are. Those are things that you have to have completed before you can receive a grant payment. We, because of the, um, uh, because the state's fiscal year is not the same as your local fiscal year, we try and get, we would we try to set the deliverables up so that we can get as many grant payments as possible out to you before June 30 when the state's fiscal year ends. So you, the deliverables will be along the line of the activities, but it may not cover every activity in your grant nor it may not cover every activity out through September 30, which is the ending date of your grant. So just keep that in mind. It is a deliberate action on our part in terms of these are the things you can get done so that we can get you payments. It may not cover every bit of minutia of what you are actually doing on the project. We have sometimes get a lot of confusion on that. And we will talk about this a little further on. We really try and encourage you when you get these deliverables to look them over and see if it's if you still think you will be able to get these done in the name all done by say june july if at all possible um the closer we get toward the ending date of the grant toward september 30 we don't want to run into any potential problems of you possibly not getting your grant payment um we've come really close the past couple years on a few and we're trying to really eliminate that if at all possible so just kind of keep that in mind when you're looking at what we send you. There is a method to our madness in some degree. And I'll throw it back over to David again. Okay. And, and I'm glad you brought that up, Marion, because uh, one thing I did want to mention at the very beginning of all this is that uh, this is a, a back and forth communication. We want to get input from you and when we're building the deliverables, this is basically, like Marion said, this is what you're going to deliver to us for in return for a payment. And we try to avoid any kind of restrictions on putting a date on any of these. We try to leave this as wide open as possible, but we do put them in a particular order which is the same order as went that you think you can accomplish these deliverables. So if if we would send you these contract details and you look at the deliverables and you go, yes, I agree, I can do all these things, but I can't do them in the order and you know that you're showing them, make sure that you let us know that and you'll be able to go into these deliverables and change the order if that's going to make it so you can successfully complete these in a in a better fashion so this is not at this point when we have just given you the no good and you've completed the change the application change request and we're just building the contract details you have options still at this point you're not locked in if you see a deliverable that you can't accomplish for some particular reason or there's documentation that you're not going to be able to provide you would want to give us options on well i can't do that particular item but i can do this and this is how i can prove i did it so I guess the way to, de to describe deliverables is that I give you a task to do and you agree to do it and then you give me proof that you completed it. That's really how this whole, op this whole thing works. And let me go back a little bit further too that there's three steps to this. The preliminary steps are the NOGA, the NOGA and the award letters basically saying we're going to get started. The next step is we start building the information that's going to be contained in the actual agreement itself. Once we all agree on both ends what that's going to be and what you're going to commit to doing for your payments, then we create the actual contract. Then you get a contract, you sign it by the entities that have the power to do that in your location, return that agreement to us and then we sign the agreement 
and then you have an agreement. So it's basically three steps, preliminary steps of notice, the building of the contract, and then you come away on the third step with a signed and completed contract. So that's the way the whole process works. And I think in the past, we've uh, probably not given everybody a clear pathway of understanding. And sometimes when you're working on, this can go back and forth several times. And I think sometimes people are kind they get a little impatient saying, you know, I just want to get a contract, but we want to make sure that we don't just get a contract. We want to get a contract that you're comfortable with and that you can get completed in the time frame, like Marion explained it. We want to try to make it so you have your payments pretty much completed by the end of June. Now, so that's the, those are the things that should be going through your mind when you're reading through once we've built the contract details and we send you the information that we'd like to you know for the, the the task we'd like to see you accomplish then you need to be thinking about that and take this seriously at this point because that's what you're going to be committing to and you know if you can't do that raise the flag early so that we can make adjustments now that being said let's just say that something does happen down the road we've always got the option of making amendments but we would like to get this as close to what everybody can live with up front and 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 avoid making changes later but we can make changes later that's that's not out of the question I want to jump in while David was just referring to that too, because this is a question we have been getting recently, and we get this every year. How, when can I start my project? And the question, the answer to that is two part. One, it depends on your local policies and procedures. So we can't tell you that absolutely. We can tell you per um, the contract and the award documents that you can start you could theoretically start the project as of the date that's on the grant that says the grant period and for the arpa grants the start date would be set was september 3rd 2021 um some organizations will allow you to start encumbering and making expenditures as of that date of the award other entities will not let you do anything until you have a signed grant agreement in place. So you need to figure that out on a local level. From our point of view, your any expenditures that occur from September 3rd through September 30, 2022 are allowable from the grant, from our from the division's perspective but you do need to follow your local policies and procedures. Um, some entities will not let you encumber the first dollar, place an order or do anything until that contract is done. Um, so you need to sure, be sure you determine that locally. That being said, we are trying real hard to work with folks. If you're under a really uh, tight timeline to do something, let us know. Um, we're, we're churning these things out as fast as we humanly can. But if we know you've got a problem or a real tight deadline, there's one meeting between now and January, a council meeting, and you've got to have it by next week to get it on that council agenda, let us know and we'll see what we can do to help you. Okay, so it's, it's a two-way street, but I just want everybody to be aware of that grant period, uh, the, starting, the starting date and the ending date. Um, so. Okay. Ties in with everything David was just saying there. Now, one thing that you'll end up seeing, and I'm just going to put this out here because I'm thinking about it right at the moment. There'll, there'll be a clause in your grant agreement that's going to talk about the length of the agreement. And that ties in with what Marion's saying that uh, depending on your local practice, when when they're going to allow you to, to start uh, spending money or at least uh, committing money to the project 
on the grant agreement itself where it has the, the statement it says length of agreement which is section two that date is the time frame from when we had authority for the funding until the end of the federal period which for, for the arpa grants is going to run september 3rd 2021 through september 30th 2022 so just remember if you have other grants that are not arpa you may see a different length of agreement on there and that is based on our internal process here and when those funds when we have permission to release those funds basically so just an explanation of why you may see a different uh, time frame in there we we've had a question come in um Okay, we got two questions come in now. The first one, the first one, I'll go ahead and answer real quickly about the contract and deliverables. Yes, they are confirmed back and forth between everybody comes to agreement between the division and the library before we send you the actual grant agreement to be signed locally. Okay, well, this could be one one shot. We get it to you. Everybody's happy then we're good or it's back and forth, whatever it takes. Once everything is satisfied, satisfactory to everybody on the contract details page, then we will then issue you the grant agreement out to you to get your local signatures, okay? And, and you may, depending on how your organization is set up, the, the people that we are communicating with back and forth on, on the grant record details and getting the the actual agreement ready for signature may not be the same people to actually sign your agreement. So if, if they have questions about what you've agreed to, you know, you may have to answer those questions in order to satisfy them that, you know, they're comfortable with signing that agreement. We don't uh, get involved with, with the local authorities as far as, you know, agreeing to, to the, uh, to the details on the contract. Um, you, you and I, uh, you as the contract manager and I or Marion will agree to the terms and we will present them for signature. And then that your local uh, authority will sign it and then return it to us, so. We do get periodic questions from county or other organization attorneys asking about con clarifications and stuff and we answer those questions of course uh but this, you know this is the base agreement that's used by the department as well as the state lots of stuff these a lot of these clauses in the agreements are required by the state not this, nothing we invented or wrote it's um uh some of these are required by the department of financial services the department of state etc cetera, etc cetera. um so that's kind of where that is for some of that information. But if you get questions, we'll be glad to try and help you answer them um, for your folks. I know a lot of folks have attorneys review them and they've never seen one of these contracts before or and they have no questions or they have lots of questions. And we, we, we deal with those a lot. So just let us know if you run into those problems. Um, I'm going back to another question that came in the chat um, regarding access to e-content and the project period um the question the answer to that is this is per but what is very clear in the authors authorizing language with the funding that comes to us services can only be available through september 30 if it's being paid for with grant funds for example if you buy something and want to buy a service agreement but you don't buy it until February. A one-year service agreement would only be able to be paid for with grant funds for the months of February through September 30. The remaining amount of funds for a one-year service agreement would have to be paid for from other funding. The same thing applies to electronic content. If you are purchasing, it's a one-time purchase such as a an ebook a one-time purchase just the same as if you bought a print book and you have it on your shelf available in perpetuity that is allowable 
If it's a subscription to a service, that subscription is only available through like a database or something that is only available through September 30. Do you want to add anything to that, David? We we looked at a lot of the yeah, applications when they came of, in. Yeah, we looked at a lot of the applications and asked folks to make revisions to their applications to make sure that that issue was addressed. Um, if we see it come in in other areas, we will be coming back to you and asking you to address that. And you kind of think of it as uh, grants pay during the grant period that doesn't restrict you. I mean, you can still like Marion said, you could have a contract start February and run through February. You just have to show the difference between what's within the grant period and what's outside of the grant period and show, you know, that only grant money is paying for that time within the grant period. And more than likely, you're going to show that uh, you're going to have other funding paying for the difference. So long as you understand that uh, the grant money is only to pay for the services taking place during the grant period. And this kind of came about on the CARES Act. Uh, there were similar conditions, but uh, I think the, the federal agency actually felt like they hadn't made it as clear as they could have on the last cycle. So when this, this cycle came out, that was one of the first things that they put in their notice was that uh, only during the grant period can these items be paid for. So they, they made that very specific. Are, are there any other questions that we haven't answered, Mary? Uh, uh, regarding Renee's no. question, with the uh, unless there's one copy, one user on e-content, you may have answered that part. Just do your explanation, another one, but just want to make sure. Um, I'm not clear on exactly what is uh, is uh, being asked there. If you if it's a one time purchase, uh, one purchase for an item, and it can be checked out one person one at a time, yes, then that would still be you know you've purchased it. I'm equating it to a print book. You buy a copy of the book, one person can check it out and read it. It would be the same thing for a one-time, yes, that type of content, yes. And we did have a lot of folks have to clarify that on their applications. They were buying one-time purchase in perpetuity, basically, for a, a, a copy of an item, which is different than a subscription to a to a, the other the other method, methods that are done. And then Craig asked, that would be the same for software we purchase. It's the, it depends, well, if it's, David, I'm going to defer to you yeah, on. I, I, it, it probably depends on what the software does. If it's like buying, if it's like buying Microsoft Office and you buy it one time. Yes, that, that would good. be. Yes, but if you're buying a software, a subscription to say uh, some kind of a, uh, back and forth online software type thing, then it would have to end September 30. Some type of a training software, I guess I could say it that way. Yes. Does that I, uh, probably, probably the best rule of thumb is if you have a question, get a hold of us so we can examine it. And uh, we made the, when we were looking at the applications, we, we made the, uh, statement about the one-time purchase because that was one way that we felt we could make it most clear is that it's like uh, I'm not paying for something forever um, I'm paying for it one one purchase and then uh, you know it's not a thing that goes on and on and can be renewed and that's the one you probably want to avoid uh, subscriptions as much as you possibly can and, and make them purchases instead Right, or be planning to have a plan that after September 30, you're going to pay for it with another source of funding. That's the shortest version. Right. But I, I probably your best bet if 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 you if you got a question, let us know. Yeah. Okay. But we're we're trying to make this so 
we all stay in the clear. That's that's really what we're trying to do. Um, we did have a question. So once we've gotten the agreement, so I guess we went back to where we were here. Once we have the agreements out to you all, you will then um, get it signed locally by whatever mechanism you have to do, whether it's somebody who has the authority to sign it or if you have to get it to a commission or or a board meeting or something of that nature to get approvals, whatever that takes. Once that's done, you would load it up back into the grant system and submit it back to us where Jennifer is work, showing us there on the signed contract. Um, and she will send instructions out when the agreement's released of what you need to do and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not gonna go into all the, the, uh, the details there. Uh, once it comes back to us, we have the state librarian sign it and uh, then we get it back right back out to you um, and you can go from there. Um, at any point in time, then once that agreement is executed, when it's signed by Amy there, once it's executed, you can then submit uh, grant payments at any point in time. As soon as you've met one or more of the deliverables, you can then submit a payment request. Uh, David, do you want me to talk about this a little bit or do you want? Uh, if we're going to move into payments, uh, I think so. Unless anyone's got any other questions about the contracts at the moment, I'm also looking at our time. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I got you. <laughs> well, let's talk about payments. Uh, okay. One of the probably uh, the most important things that you're going to be. Uh, how do you get your money? Yes, I know that's you get your important money? to many you people. Wanna, you, are you? Uh, Huh? You gonna you gonna start it? I can talk on a little bit. Um, okay. Once you've met one or more of your deliverables, it's your choice when you want to submit grant payments. Some folks can't do anything without getting some cash in hand, and we've tried to be sensitive to that when we've done the deliverables to do some do some deliverables that will let you get some cash flow going. Didn't always work for everybody, but we've really tried to do that in some in as much as we could to at least get some funding started to you. Want, or you can choose to wait and submit multiple payments at one time at any point during the grant. Uh, you would go to the grant records details page, and then the second heading there is the payments heading. Um, when you are ready to submit a payment, you would then uh, click on the um, uh, request payment button that's over there on the far right, and it would open up and, and then let you provide you information provide you with a page, I can't even spit this out this morning, that would then show, tell you can tell us which ones you are submitting a payment request for. As David mentioned earlier, you can do one or multiple at the same time, but they must be done in order. In other words, you cannot submit payment request one, followed by payment request four, followed by payment request two. They must be done in this order. So very important for you to look at those deliverables. Uh, uh, when you are looking in the contract details. We tr we tried to use your timelines you gave us or any other information you gave us in the application to put this in something resembling logical order. Uh, if you're ordering large pieces of equipment, we know there may be delivery delays, so we tended to have the delivery of them at the very end so that you could keep things going, that type of thing. You may not wa want that, it's up to you. Um, Anyway, you would check whichever payment you're submitting for, you check the box, and then you would uh, go down a little further and attach whatever the deliverable says that you're gonna do the documentation of, uh, documenting payment to, you're gonna give us whatever we say there, invoices for these different things. You would add them there in the payment documentation. You would upload the payment documentation at any, any as many um, documents as you need to add. You would give us an invoice period date, which for the first payment is typically from the date the contract is signed until the date you are requesting the payment. Um, subsequent payments would be from whatever date to the whenever, whatever the date is you are requesting that payment. Um, and then you would, once you have all that information, you would click the submit button at the bottom. I know. Uh, and then there is a confirmation page that sometimes takes a minute or two to load into the system. You then have to confirm that payment submission. 
if you don't confirm that, we never get it. So just keep that in mind. It'll still be there in the system, but it will not have been transmitted to us. And to also help us, um, to also help us, you would uh, send us an email outside the system that says, hey, I just submitted a payment request and we'll go and look and see. And if for some reason we don't see something, we'll let you know um, it didn't go through or something or, yeah, we got it. We're going to process it. Once we get it, uh, David will be reviewing the payment or myself. We review the payment request. We look at the documentation to see if it's what we needed, if it's appropriate. If it is, we will then approve the payment request. And then it goes on from our office to our finance and accounting office and then to the Department of Financial Services where everybody audits it, those things. They look at the, the documentation and what have you. If everything is in order, then they will issue the payment out to you. Uh, we have typically been telling folks it takes approximately four to six weeks to get a payment out to you from the date it is approved by us. Um, sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's not. Fair warning, the closer you get to the end of June, the slower things are because the state is wrapping up its fiscal year. The same thing that happens to you locally is you get close to September 30. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, the, our finance and accounting office also has to draw down cash from the feds. Um, before they can pay things out. So sometimes that may take a few more days, um, that type of thing. So just kind of keep that in mind. And then you can also see the status of your payments from your grant detail page, the date it was submitted, the date it was approved, um, and see where things are in the process there. And if you don't see something you're looking for, again, let us know and we can try and help you. Did I cover everything, David? <laughs> uh, just one. I always have one, to... Sure. One thing is that uh, if if we don't receive what the uh, deliverable calls for, I will return it to you and and don't get upset because uh, it would make me very happy if I always got everything that the documentation calls for, but that doesn't always happen. So in that particular case, I will return it back to you. It'll be an RFI, which is a request for information. The uh, notes block in on the payment will have the details of the additional information we're looking for, and you will also get an email with the with the same uh, information on it. So, either way, you'll have notification of why it was returned, and then. It's, you know, what you need to do then is just, you know, collect the additional information that's requested, attach it to the the request, and then resubmit it. So, and most of the time, sometimes, you know, you'll upload a document and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't upload for some reason. It's, it's things like that that happen the most often. But sometimes uh, you'll miss one of the items on, you know, on the uh, documentation, something to that effect. So... But most of the time, uh, once it, uh, I return it to you, and, and if you get it back to me, uh, you know, pretty quickly, it doesn't take very long, you know, to get it on its way after that. So uh, that is, in a, like Marion said, you know, you can't do them out of order. It makes the system go bonkers. So uh, you have to keep them, keep them in order when you make the request. But if you wanted to, theory theoretically, you could... Uh, do all five payments at once. If you had the activities completed and you had the documentation to prove it, you could you could do them all at once. I don't know that I've ever had anybody do that, but you could. I have had folks do that for some other grant programs. Doesn't happen too often. Yes, it depends upon your local uh, administration and cash flow and that type of thing. Yeah. Um, we've had a couple more questions come in. Uh, one question was, when do we need to convert the DUNS to the UEI by? That will be needed to be done by April. Um, so you can go ahead right now, before April, you can use, uh, you're already set up, so you could go ahead and request your grant payment with your DUNS number while you're in the process of getting that UEI number converted. Um, and that's probably something the city, in your case, Zach, is probably the city will be doing that or will, should be doing that already. 
Um, and then we had another question come in that's a specific question related to deliverables and payments. Um, we can, Danielle, we'll get with you offline on this question. This is related to cash flow and being able to do something. We may, we can work with you on possibly adjusting some of the um, uh, deliverables or something, but we can talk to you on to that a little bit without tying up the whole group, if that's all right. Yeah, the short answer for that one is that uh, we'll negotiate that out. We'll make it so we can have a deliverable that's going to work. It may be something that your city is willing to float that difference until you get the payment, or they may not be. I don't know. Um, you may have to have some other discussions before before we settle everything. So we'll talk about that a little later. That's one thing I, I can't emphasize enough is that uh, just keep the lines of communication open don't you know if you know for sure that something's not going to work for you say something you know up front and say it you know early in the process and, and we'll we'll make it so that you're, you've got something that you can work with now that kind of is a segue into our next uh, section here about change requests remember earlier i talked about there's two types of change requests, the application change request before you have an agreement, after you have a signed agreement and you want to make a change to something in the process, then that's when you do a change request. Most of the time, a change request is asking basically permission to move the funding around within categories. And this happens on you know all the time and you know let's face it uh, this is a pretty uh, changeable world nowadays and things happen and you have to adjust and uh, when that happens to you that's when you need to make a, a change request you can always run by us you know up front what your situation is I suggest you do that and we'll you know look at your situation and give you advice you don't ever end up getting a, a contract amendment without first submitting a change request but a change request doesn't always turn into an amendment and what we've done is kind of streamline that process in the system a little bit so that we can make quite a few changes in there without doing an amendment but if it gets into the details of the budget depending on the amount of change you're going to make or if it, get, it gets into the deliverables and how they're going to be documented then that's going to require an amendment and that would even be if you need to change the order of the deliverables that would require an amendment as well uh, we've done pretty well in later years not having a lot of those but there are still times when things happen and it just can't be avoided. And most of the time, anytime I have an amendment, I get that approved through the director. So you have to give me some material to work with because what the director wants to see is justification for making the amendment. If you can provide me with reasonable justification for making the amendment, I can more than likely get that approved to, to amend the contract. So that's the way that process works. And uh, I can't say that that's been an area where it's been a big issue in, in the last couple cycles. Okay, uh, we're gonna go on to, uh, now, as you've noticed on, on the page, the details page is your number one working area when you're doing work on the grant. I mean, you're doing change requests, application change requests. We just talked about payments. That, that, that's the page where you can see a copy of the actual agreement that you have. Once the agreement's completed, that shows up on that page as well, where it says agreements and amendments. The amendments will be there as well. Uh, down below under forms and reports that's where the contract is so everything about the process and the grant management comes from this page basically later on in this in the process you'll have mid-year reports that you do 
that's going to show up under progress reports, the heading under progress reports. So, and then the mid year, once we populate that, once we get everybody uh, going and we have contracts out there, you'll start seeing the uh, reports information populate on that screen. And uh, sometimes the mid year will come up a long time before the final, but we're probably <clears throat> probably going to try to get those out there a little sooner. I'm losing my voice, Marion. Sorry. <clears throat> That's okay. <laughs> um, real quick, we have a question from Ann. Would a change in vendor but not cost require a change request? Um, I would say no. <clears throat> um, no, I would say it would not. Um, it just if the, if the dollar amounts are still the same, no, you're still good. We don't hang it off a particular vendor. It's basically the dollars. You know, you're buying, you're going to use vendor A to get compute, you know, 20 computers, and instead, when you did your procurement process, you're going to get vendor B instead, using that same amount of money. You're still good, so you would not have to do a change request there. And as David was saying, change requests happen. They just have it's it, especially right now. It, they just happen. It happens. It happens. So you know, if you have questions, you want to. If you think you're going to have to change something, just let us know. Um, and I'm going to answer the next question. Um, do I understand you say you do not want money returned if there is a snafu with one of the approved activities? Absolutely not. We want you to spend that money because if that money comes back to us, it's going to go straight back to the federal government and be just completely gone. So if things change during the project, Please, if it looks like you're going to have money left over, say you thought you were going to spend $1,000 on a box and it comes in at $800, what are you going to do with that $200? You want to buy more smaller boxes or more box, I don't know, you know, whatever you're going to do, please talk with us. And, you know, we do not want the money back. You know, if you don't spend it, you're going to have to send it back to us, but we do not want it back. And so that's why we have the change request process in place to give you some flexibility to make changes that happen during the project. Please, 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 please do not go to the end of the project and suddenly say, here's a whole lot of money back. Because by that point in time, it's too late for us to do anything. Um, also, as it gets, you know, don't delay on getting your orders done, like your procurements for uh equipment and what have you we all know we're all hearing about the delivery process and stuff get that going as soon as possible and then later on in the year if you're running into problems talk to us but don't wait excuse me until march to order something i mean you know as soon as you get these agreements signed as soon as you can and and don't wait to get the pro procurement processes take time we know that Get your local procurement folks ready to go on your requisitions or whatever paperwork, advertising, bidding you may have to do, depending upon what you're purchasing and the amounts that you're purchasing, et cetera. Um, don't wait. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, we've ran into a lot of heartburn this past year with folks at the end really scrambling to have to get everything done. So please, please, please make it easier on all of us. Don't wait. <laughs> You're exactly right, Marion. We we would prefer We're that, you. <laughs> yeah, we would prefer yeah. that the money gets spent by you and not sent back. So, and we'll do everything we can can to make sure that happens. <clears throat> now I'm looking it's, at it's back to that line of communication. Talk, check in with us early if it looks like you're running into a problem, or you may think you're running into a problem because we may have some solutions or suggestions for you. Just don't sit on it and wait, please. Now I'm looking at what we have on our list here of items we wanna cover. And most of these items I see left here are going to show up on our webpage as far as guidance of things that uh, you need to know in managing an LSTA or related contract. And uh, I'll try to cover some of these kind of quickly. And you're going to see 
the ARPA page is not going to have all these items on it. You're going to have to go to the LSTA page on the on the web page to get more details. But let's go with the first one I see here, acknowledgement of funding and funding statement. When you make public statements about your grant, there are certain requirements that the federal government has where you have to acknowledge where the funding came from and the, how the funding is distributed across that project. So there's a section in the LSTA uh, guidance that talks about acknowledgement of federal support and giving credit to LSTA and the division. And then there's another section below that, I believe it is, Jennifer, that talks about maybe it's a different section, talks about the funding, how the funding is allocated across the project. It's the top of the page there. It's the top of the page? Yeah, right there. Okay. Those items, and if, if there's a statement here on the LSTA page and it says LSTA, all you need to do for an ARPA grant is replace LSTA with ARPA. And those, and a lot of you that have been involved in these uh, programs before have done these statements. For those of you that haven't, you could look at some of the ones that you did. If you look at announcements you've seen from other uh, entities that have had grants, when they do like a press release or something, you'll see these announcements at the bottom of the press release. You can use those as samples, as guides to go by, but if you have questions, if you're doing some kind of public announcement on one of these, if you need some assistance with that, we'll help you and get you the, the help you need on that, and we can get you an example. Uh, I'm going to go on. Uh, allowable and unallowable costs. There are in the grant agreement itself, there are some statements in there about things that are not specifically not allowed. I know Marion likes to talk about this one in particular. Uh, <laughs> what section's that under? Uh, Which one? That This under the what you can and can't do, allowable funds, it's on that page. Uh, yeah, but, I, but I mean, in the contract itself, it covers that too, I believe. Right. It does refer, there are two document. there are two major things that relating to allowable and unallowable costs. Uh, because the grant funds come through the state of Florida, there are some things that may be allowable under the federal law, but are not allowable under state law. Uh, and so you have to follow the state requirements. The biggest one I do use as an example is food. Uh, for example, food at a program. With certain exceptions, you cannot do that. Um, the food at a program is allowable under the uh, federal act, but under the state of Florida, you cannot use grant or matching funds if you're using matching for uh, food. So there was a document called the Reference Guide to State Expenditures. There is a link to that in your documentation that you've been provided. And then these are some of the general things that we've done. There's the reference guide. And it's some very nice dry reading should you have insomnia any one night. Um, it's a real good cure for a lot of those things. Uh, it talks about some of the big things such as purchasing um, contracts, furniture, different types of services, things like that travel um related to allowable expenditures i don't think many folks this time around had any travel in their grants but if you do um you must use state of florida rates for travel which are definitely less than the federal rates for travel you must use state travel rates uh travel costs and that's related to mileage some other limitations and things of that nature. Uh, so if you have any questions there, look on here, give us a call, we can help you in that regard. Also, uh, another area is time tracking. If you're going to uh, have grant uh, funding for positions, you need to come up with a way to track 
the time that the people spend on the project and their hours and it's not prescribed you know that you have to do this a specific way and we ran into this in the last cycle with several entities that had to provide information about uh, uh, labor hours spent on the project. So I would just advise that uh, you make sure that some way the hours for the position that's paid with grant funding are tracked. You know, you don't have to provide those to us unless it happens to be uh, in an audit, if it happened to be an audit that we did, and we do do those periodically, or it happened to be part of your deliverable documentation, but you would be expected to have that information on hand should anyone from the state or the federal government ask for that information. So just as a note, that uh, make sure you are tracking the hours spent on the project in some manner and that you would be able to get to those records readily if you needed to do so. Uh, also, uh, the equipment, uh, you have I'm to... I'm going to jump in here for just a second, David. Go ahead. The question is, Go ahead. is the tracking the same for in-kind matching? Uh, yes. The answer to that would be yes. Um, uh, while matching funds are not required on the grant, if you are wanting to report a portion of someone's time in support of the grant as matching, you are allowed to report matching. You're not mandated for ARPA. Uh, you would need to be able to track that as well. So if you're claiming, say, 10% of your time is was spent on this project for the entire year and the auditor came back and said, prove that to me, how would you track that? Folks do different things. They do spreadsheets with dates and the number of hours per day or the date, the date and the number of hours that day spent on the project so that you could total them up and get a dollar figure to go uh, to report as matching. So yeah, that's what we would recommend. If you're going to report any staff time, yes, track it. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. What? Go ahead. I'll go on to the equipment. I guess you were starting. Sorry. Equipment. Uh, you have to also keep an inventory of equipment purchased with grant funding that is individual items over five thousand dollars. Now that changed since what? Last year, Marion. July one of twenty, actually. Two years ago. It was okay. Increased from one thousand to five thousand dollars. Um, if you purchased equipment before July 1, 2020, and you've reported it to us on an inventory, you still have to re retain the, that tracking, but now the threshold is up to $5,000. And we do and that because... You may, have, you may have local requirements that record that require equipment below $5,000 to be inventoried and tracked. That's fine. That's a local issue. You will only have to report to us equipment over... $5,000 at this point. And I think uh, Marion already touched on uh, travel. Uh, there's a, an in, a kind of a category we have here of what you cannot do, uh, but that's covered pretty extensively on the uh, guidance pages. Uh, there's all kinds of rules about discrimination and so forth that you know you can't you can't violate federal law, state law, any of those kind of things. Most of that is itemized specifically in the grant agreement on the, on the specific things you can't do. Which uh, and then you can see on that particular page if you do any of those things that could lead to to a uh, an issue of non-compliance where you're not complying with laws or statutes so you want to avoid any of those items but i don't think that most uh entities are have an issue with uh you know doing things that are illegal at least that we're aware of so uh the One other thing, thing i do want to call to, to your attention is if you're doing anything with web pages or online stuff you need to verify, you know, be sure in terms of accessibility 
uh, of those things, uh, accessible documents, accessible web pages that meet uh, meet mm. those requirements. The I believe it's Section 508, etc., where you know whether that's the alt text or what have you. You know, you need to be sure that you're aware and implementing those types of things as well. And the next area that uh, we want to talk about here is reporting. Uh, we have requirements of a mid-year report, which is basically a very simple report that basically talks about what has taken place thus far and what is going on with the activities. It doesn't delve into the financial part. It's just kind of a a gut check basically that says where are we at at this point and sometimes on a mid-year report since the mid-year report comes fairly early at the end of january you don't have a lot to report and uh, that's okay too i mean but you do need to give us a status of where everything's at if everything is just getting started that's what you'll be telling us the other one is the final report which uh, one thing I wanted to mention when we were talking about uh, putting this presentation together, you wanna keep track of all the things that go on during the year. You know, if you made change requests, I would make sure I had those documents, you know, organized in one location where you can find them. Everything you reported on your payment request, have that documentation handy, a lot of the things that we build into the deliverables are gonna be things that we wanna see in the final report, especially when it gets into the, the required surveys that, and most people would know about the, uh, the surveys that the federal government in specific activities, there are surveys that need to be done and data that should be collected to show that you did those surveys and when the final report is due, we need to have the details, the data that went into those surveys or came out of those surveys, that needs to be in your final report. So I, my advice would be that all of this would be a lot easier on the final report if you keep all that information current and just uh, you're kind of gonna have a data dump at the end of the year that goes into that final report because if the federal government wants to see the results of the surveys, they wanna see the results of your activities, they wanna know how many activities you did, how many people attended, all your trainings, they wanna see all that information because in the end, that is how all this financing is justified to the legislature and it helps increase the chances of keeping this funding a source flowing. So there's a means to the end here that uh, we want that information. We need a good complete final report so that we can give that information to IMLS, which in return can give it to their reporting authorities so that they can prove that this money is, is doing what it's supposed to be doing and getting the results that we want out in your communities. You have anything you want to add on that, Marion? No, I think you've got it covered there. It's uh, a lot for those of you that are doing a lot of activities other than procure just straight procurement. Uh, one of the first deliverables on the grant is tell us how you're going to evaluate it, which is the things you're going to count based upon the requirements from the feds. And uh, we don't just put that in there for an exercise. Um, you should be counting that stuff as soon as you can. Don't wait until the end of the project to think about counting. That's why we have that as one of the first deliverables is to you know think about those evaluations. We do have information about the evaluation type questions on, on the webpage here, but I'm not gonna go into those into a whole lot of detail. But uh, yeah, the more, more you can give us about what happened with the, rep with the project, how it went, what kind of feedback you got, besides just we bought things, um, you know, were people using it? Were they not using it? Did they love it? Did they hate it? What problems did you run into? You know, et cetera, et cetera. The more you give us, the more we can turn around and give to the feds. It makes life a lot easier for everybody. And then I the would, final report, of course, will be due November 1, 22. 
And that did remind me that Jennifer has the required evaluation questions page up on the screen. A lot of you that are just getting your deliverables now, if you have a number one deliverable that talks about evaluation questions and you see a heading in there that I've put into the deliverable, that you can go to this section, the required evaluation questions, and look for that particular heading, and it'll give you the questions, like you see library workforce here, and the, and the questions under library workforce. If it's instruction, it's you know it'll say instruction, but I am giving you the headings in the deliverables so that you can go to this section in the guidance and get the questions that are required by the federal government. So that when you're doing that deliverable, it's just a matter of going here, looking for the heading that shows up on your deliverable, make sure that you have those questions in your survey and show me that those are the questions you're gonna ask and you've got your first deliverable done. So that, I'm trying to make it as easy as possible on these, but then uh, what I'm saying is, once you commit to that on the deliverable, then when you do your final report, we need to see the data from those survey questions that you ask. And remember once again, and it's in the guidance, you can ask other questions besides those, but we need to make sure that when they're the required surveys, that the required questions are included in your survey document. And there's a um, question in the chat. Do you accept videos? Uh, good question. I'm not quite sure what the context of that is intended to be. Is it, we, our system is set up to accept pretty much any type of document and document format. Um, so you well, should be able to submit it Maybe a matter of file size, though. So really, I'm not quite clear on what you're asking there. It, we've accepted videos as a deliverable. So what you know, I, the past uh, cycle we had where you had to create, you know, a training video or whatever, and then give us a link to that as your documentation for the deliverable. So I would say in that case, yes. If you wanted to do it as supplemental on your final report, as far as I know, the system will accept it as well. And those type of things, depending on you know the quality and the content, may end up going to uh, IMLS with your permission. Then Cindy clarified videos of activities. Yes. I would say in yes, in most cases, yes. Okay. As we're barreling down to the end of this, there's just one more thing I wanted to mention, and that is at the end of your project, there is an audit due. Um, in most place, in most cases, for everybody that's on this right now, everybody that's gotten funding at this point, this would be an audit of your county or city government the annual there's different names for it comprehensive annual financial report the CAFR, the audit it's all the same things that are done at the end of the fiscal year it's done for the entire entity uh, once that's done pretty much everybody has that in place every year once that's done there is a two-part thing there's a certification that must be submitted in the grant system that set, tells us whether or not your city or county expended more than $750,000 from either all federal sources as well as all state sources. And if it is yes to either one of those questions, then you must uh, provide us with a copy of the single audit. You'll upload that into the grant system. Uh, and any of the entities that are on that already receive state aid to libraries, you're already doing this. Um, uh, it's already part of the process of what you're doing, a uh, similar type thing. If if you're with another entity and you have questions, you can let let me know and we can help you through that process. But that'll occur after the end of November, at, end of September, excuse me. Uh, so that's basically all that I had. Um, we are uh, 
the webinar is scheduled to run till 11.30, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. However, we will stay on for as long as you, if you have more questions, Daryl, if you want to unmute folks, uh, that would be fine. They can just ask them or they can put them into chat. Uh, we will be posting this recording up later as soon as we can get it processed back to our webpage. Uh, and we can, you know, keep answering questions that you may have about your grant. So we're not going to just cut it off, but if you all need to leave, we do understand. So uh, we'll stay on for as long as you all need us to, uh, to uh, answer your questions. All right, Marion, I am unmuting everybody now. And then we have a question in the chat. Zachariah says, turns out we already have Sam's UEI. We'll take number. care of that, Zach. Yep, we'll take care of that for you. Thank you, Craig. I have a question. Sure. Uh, this is Adania from North Miami Beach. Hi, Adania. Uh, how are you? Hanging in uh, there. We're, we're excited about this. <laughs> However, I am one of those that will be on a time crunch okay. to bring it up to the commission in December for December's meeting. It is okay. the third week of the month. And um, since ours involves doing some collaboration with a educational facility like uh, Miami-Dade College or a different college. I, you know, the semester would begin in January. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. I am pressed for time to have um, okay. the paperwork ready to submit <laughs> so, to the so attorney. <laughs> so okay. we'll see what we can do to get that out to you just as soon as possible. Um, but on my end, uh, Mary, and I'm thinking I need to call the university, make sure that they're still on board. If not, right, right. you know, find yeah. someone else just so that we're all up to date. Right. I would recommend that you go ahead and do whatever preparatory work you need to do. In other words, get your partners lined up, take a look at your application, and be sure there's no other changes. That would okay. do that. Take a look at your application. Be sure there's no changes right now and let us know. Just drop me a note or drop us a note and let us know. And then we can okay. get this out to your, your contract details followed by your agreements out pretty quickly. Um, and uh, and then while we're doing that and you're getting it to the, to the city council, you can you know, be talking to your partners and doing your preparatory work and get, you know, getting everything lined up so that as soon as that agreement's signed, you can start what you have to do type of thing. Okay. All right. Thank so, yeah, you very much. Take a look at those. Just yeah, take a look at those applications real quick. And if you can let us know today, we should keep things moving pretty quickly for you on that. Okay, we'll do. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from folks? This is called stump the chump period. <laughs> You can type. You can huh? type it in too if you don't want to talk. Yeah, if you want to type it in the chat, that's fine too. I saw a hand raised that went away, so I'm not sure if that was a question or not. Hello, this is uh, Kimberly Norton Parks from Pasco County. Um, Sorry, we, we're, there's a couple of us listening in the office and the echo is driving me nuts. Um, oh, sorry. sorry about that. <laughs> um, so my question is, is um, we are actually currently being renovated, um, but the renovation we found out last week has been pushed back by six weeks. And so we were curious if we have to, um, we're talking about reaching out to a local church or a local um, partner to kind of help provide services that way? Do we need to change I, our I missed the I missed the beginning of it. Did you say one of your locations is being renovated? So the location in which we um, applied for the grant, the South Holiday uh -huh. Library, is currently uh -huh. closed for renovation and uh -huh. we were slated to reopen in February. 
Uh -huh. However, it has been pushed back to the supply chain. Okay, I got you now. So you may need to be changing the actual physical location where that's going yes. to be held, but you're still doing yes. the same services, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, David, I'll let you weigh in there. Do we need a change? Probably would not hurt to do a change request. Um, well, I would say, let me rephrase that. Look at your application. If you say a specific location, you may want to submit a change request so that we're not tying you to that location. Um, you know, that's fine. You could go ahead and do that. Okay, thank you. And if I tell you what, if you uh, if you just get the details and send me a quick email, and then just tell me, you know, if you're, you know, how big of a change you're going to have to make, and then we'll carry it from there. Great, thanks. <laughs> okay. Great. Any other questions? And David, your response in the chat was that to a uh, question, do we know when to expect the contracts deliverable agreements? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, as soon as possible. To, we have to, over 50 to, of these to get out the door, so it's a, it's a bit of a process and we're going like mad, so yeah. <laughs> Any other 